Waves are everything around us. It's the ocean crashing at the sea. It's the light from the sun giving life to earth. It's the soundtrack of this video and the sound of you clicking that subscribe button. Wait, what? Who put that in the script? Yet yeah, often when they're taught in physics, too many details are overlooked. Just take a look at the long list of assumptions used to find the wave equation. So, in this video, I want to build an intuition for why we use and why it's okay to use these premises. Then, we'll take those ideas and try to apply them to discover for ourselves why waves appear everywhere from ocean waves to the background music of this video to the very light that lets you see this video. But to start, what is a wave? Well, when we say wave equation, most physicists will point to this equation. But really, the term wave equation is more of a broad descriptor masquerading as a single equation. It's like if I ask you what this graph is, you might say tangent or x cubed, but no, it's actually x to the fifth. They can all be broadly categorized as up on the right and down on the left, but they all have their differences. Wave equations are like this too. We've already seen the wave equation, and here's another one that also has wave-like solutions. We can see they're fundamentally different equations because one has a second derivative, while the other has a first, but both describe wave behaviors. Even if there's not one rigorous definition for waves, we can still generalize what types of conditions can create them. For example, let's look again at our string. There's two equal forces on every section of the string, the tension from the left and the tension from the right. Our total force depends on where those tension forces are pointed. If it's more vertical on the left, then that will pull our little section of the rope down. If it's more vertical on the right, that pulls our rope up. Of course, if both sides are bent up, then our section of the rope also gets pulled up. And if both sides bend down, then our rope gets pulled down. Understanding the wave equation from this point of view makes a little more sense. On the left-hand side of the equation, we have the second time derivative, which is a force term. The second position derivative on the right describes a sort of local displacement. What do I mean by local displacement? Well, you've probably heard the second derivative being the curve of a function, so let's try to understand the equation from that point of view. When the second derivative is greater, the rope is more curved, and our local section of the rope is further from its neighbors, so the restoring force is greater. Conversely, when the second derivative is less, the rope is less curved, so our section of the rope is not displaced very far from its neighbors, and therefore the restoring force is small. Let's also take a deeper dive into how this wave equation leads to wave behaviors. A common example for this is the Gaussian shape. We'll say our rope is traveling leftwards, and okay, now let's press play. And now, pause. Let's analyze this single fruits frame. At the top, our rope curves down, so there's a restoring force down. On both sides of the Gaussian, the rope curves up, so we have a force up. Wait a minute. If the forces are symmetrical, how can the wave be traveling only leftwards? Shouldn't the wave split off? Well, this is where we have to remember that some of the information is lost when we take a freeze frame. We miss the fact that the bit of rope here on the right has downward momentum, and that the force is acting against that momentum. The bit of rope on the left has momentum upwards, and the force amplifies that movement further. Now, we can also describe our string example more mathematically. All we have to do is give our string a density, rho, and Newton's second law in the vertical direction tells us that the difference in the vertical components of tension is related to the vertical acceleration. What about the horizontal direction? Well, remember that we assume the string only moves vertically so we can ignore the horizontal. Since we're also considering tension to be constant and angles to be small, we can further simplify as such. From here, the math isn't too difficult. As always, if you would like to look at any of these steps in detail, just pause. But you can see we have our wave equation from earlier. Okay, now that we really understand the wave equation and understand our derivation of it, let's go back to why we make so many assumptions. First the math gets absurdly complicated. If we take away the assumptions, we can see how the equations begin to evolve. Here's allowing larger amplitudes, now letting tension change, and allowing some amount of horizontal movement, 
Now, I'm not even 100% sure that these equations are correct. They're so absurdly complicated that I couldn't even find anyone on the internet who's tried this before and for me to check my work against. That alone should tell you how unnecessarily detailed this is. But we can't just make assumptions because the math works out nicely. How close really is this wave equation to these other more complicated ones? Well, here I've done the experiment in real life and overlaid our approximate wave equation. You can see how closely they match. We can also simulate our more complicated wave equations against each other. And you can see how these match as well. But maybe that's not satisfying enough to convince you that we can make these premises. So as a metaphor, let's really think deeply about this problem. Take a moment and ask yourself, were there any other hidden assumptions we made in solving this problem? You might have thought of air resistance. We ignored gravity too. We assumed the density of the string didn't change as we compressed and stretched it. Heck, if you really, really want to get into nitty gritty details, we ignored the gravitational attraction of the string to itself. Does the charge distribution change just a little as we make the waves? Hey, what about the special relativistic effects? The string is moving, so they should apply. In fact, the string is accelerating too, so we should continue with relativity as well. Now, okay, it's a little obvious that none of these play any significant role in our model. That's exactly the same idea with the premises we made in deriving the wave equation. Those about tension and having no horizontal movement. It might be a little less obvious to make those assumptions, but they're just as valid. I think another thing that's a little trippy about this is that we can control the amplitude of the wave. But we can't really control air resistance, unless if we went to extreme lengths like doing this experiment in a tank of argon gas. Unfortunately, that's just something we kind of have to accept for the example of the string. After all, our model of the wave in the string is just that, a model. It is important to keep in mind where our model fails, but that's not where the power of the model comes from. Its power is to help us understand phenomena in simpler ways in those cases where it does apply. Now, let's move on to the next example, ocean waves. Let's start by analyzing this from a qualitative point of view. The movement of water is governed by differences in pressure. If we set up a flat surface of water, imagine this being a perfectly still pond. The pressure at each height level is the same, so the water has no reason to flow, and we don't get any movement here. But if we disturb this a little bit, maybe we throw a big rock into the pond, now, there's a pressure gradient which forces water to the right. Now, what happens when that water moves to the right? Well, it's going to shove the water that was already there out of its way, some of which will go upwards. We can already see a lot of similarities here to string waves. In both examples, it's a local height difference creating a sort of restoring force to the wavefront. Now, for a more rigorous treatment of this problem, Let's try to quantify the process we just described. What we said about water flowing to the right and subsequently raising the wave height is actually conservation of mass. The net flow of water into a column has to equal the change in height of that column. We can describe that through this integral, which just says to sum up all the little bits of water going into the column and equal that to the change in height of the column. What we said about pressure can also be tied back to the height of the water column. Whatever the pressure is at any point, it has to be sufficient to support the weight of the water above it. This equation, pressure equals rho gh, describes that process. Now, in these two equations, we have three variables, so it seems to be unsolvable. However, there's a hidden third equation. We can relate the pressures to the acceleration of the water, which then gives us the speed via an integral. From here, the math isn't too difficult. Again, I wouldn't call this math part of the essence of what a wave is, but there is one step I would like to know, and that is we have two equations here. One du dx equals dh dt, and the other dh dx equals du dt. Keep this in mind as we'll see it again in the light waves. Notice how we also use the small amplitude assumption again? It might be a little tricky to spot, but right here when we take the height out of the integral, we use a small amplitude assumption. But if we really wanted a full picture of waves, we would once again have to consider deeply all the hidden assumptions that we made. 
For example, our equation rho gh technically only applies to still water. To account for water accelerating upwards, there has to be an additional pressure supporting that upward flow. We also could have considered things like the viscosity of water, and it's because of these simplifications that our water doesn't look exactly like real life waves. However, just as with our string, our wave equation already gives us a great intuition for waves. Now, ironically, and kind of going against my point here, these nuances for ocean waves, and only for ocean waves in specific, are really interesting. Think about Avatar's water simulations or Titanic. So I'll link a few resources in the description if you would like to check this out. Now, so far we've only talked about waves that we can see, but some waves like sound waves aren't visible because, well, air is invisible, and that makes building the intuition a little bit harder. Luckily for us, sound waves are very similar to ocean waves because they both involve the movement of fluids, sound being related to air and oceans to water. But there's still a couple of slight differences that will make a huge difference when we go to compute them. First, let's carefully ask ourselves, what are we actually describing when we say wave? For example, when we talk about ocean waves, we're describing how the surface changes and acts like a wave. We don't mean the water molecules themselves are waves, the water itself is just a medium. Likewise, for sound waves, the air is a medium. But air doesn't have a surface that's changing, so where is the wave? If we visualize all the little air molecules, we can see the molecules getting squished together as the wave moves through. So the thing that's acting like a wave here is the compressed part, or the dense air. Aha! The wave is a wave of density. Dense areas also have higher pressure, hence it's also a wave of pressure. In general, this type of wave, called longitudinal waves, are definitely more confusing because the medium moves in parallel to the wave. So it can sometimes be strange to mentally separate the movement of the wave versus the movement of the medium. In contrast, it's very easy to determine what the wave actually is when the wave is transverse, or when the medium moves perpendicularly to the wave like our ocean waves or like the string. Another key difference between ocean waves and sound waves is the fact that even though both are fluids, water is a liquid while air is a gas. Because of this difference, we'll need not the pressure law from before, but instead the ideal gas law. In fact, because we know sound is fast, it is adiabatic, where the energy transferred between molecules is very small. And for adiabatic processes, we have this relationship for pressure and volume. Why this is true is actually quite complex, but in short, Boltzmann's laws gives us a relationship between speed of the molecules and temperature. And from there, a whole lot of conservation of energy laws gives us this relationship. Now we can rewrite volume by carefully considering how the air moves. Let's start with a volume bounded by x1 and x2, and let's say they move delta x1 and delta x2 respectively. Well, then the new volume of the air will be this. Now, doing some further simplification, again, we're passing over a lot of the math here, but as always, feel free to go back and pause. But we get this wave equation. We can actually do a bit of a sanity check, since we know what the speed of sound is, 343 meters per second, or 767 miles per hour. Not super hard to remember because it's so symmetric. The highlighted term is the wave speed and should be around that 340 value. Knowing pressure and density of air at standard conditions, we find that it is in fact about 340 meters per second, which is very close. Isn't that really exciting? Physics is all about building models, and when your models actually correlate to the real phenomenon, that's just an amazing feeling. Finally, let's discuss our last example of waves, light or electromagnetic waves. This type of wave is even stranger yet. For example, you may know that this type of wave doesn't need a medium to propagate. So how exactly is light created? Well, that starts from Maxwell's equations, which govern all phenomenon electric or magnetic. Specifically, we'll need Ampere's law and Lenz's law. Ampere's law gives us a relationship between a changing electric field and a magnetic field. It tells us that for any surface, as an easy example, a circle, the change in electric field through the surface equals the magnetic field along the border of the surface. 
Lenz's law is almost identical, but with electric and magnetic fields swapped. Now, let's think about a qualitative example. Imagine at some point in space, we have some electric field oscillating. Doesn't really matter how exactly this happens, but you could imagine this as us sending some alternating current through an antenna. Now, that alternating electric field, according to Ampere's law, is going to create a magnetic field. And now since we have a magnetic field, well, Lenz's law says that must create some more electric field. Then the new electric field will create magnetic field, and the process goes on and on again. E field, or electric field, creates B field, or magnetic field, creates more E field, creates more B field. It's like the E field and B field are buddying up to amplify each other, whereas in our previous types of waves, we described them with a local restoring force. Let's analyze the electromagnetic wave from a more mathematical standpoint now. To do so, we'll assume our wave is moving in this direction, such that E field is only up and down, and B field is only in and out of the page. That lets us create these convenient surfaces, simple rectangles where the top and bottom sides have zero contribution, to use for Ampere's and Lenz's laws. That gives us these laws governing this behavior, and as these rectangles approach zero width, we'd end up with these derivative relationships. We have dE dx is to dB dt, as dB dx is to dE dt. Now, combining these equations gives exactly the same form of wave equation from earlier, and further confirmation that we did it right comes from the wave speed, which turns out to be exactly the speed of light, as we should expect. Again, you might find it very strange that this type of wave results from a sort of teamwork between electric and magnetic fields instead of some local restoring force. But is that really so strange? Let's take a look at our ocean waves again. We have that same relationship between velocity's derivative and height's derivative, and thinking about it qualitatively makes sense too. The movement of water causes a change in the height, but that change in height creates a pressure difference that moves the water. Then the movement of the water creates another change in height, and the height difference causes the water to move, and so on. That's a hint that our electromagnetic waves are not so different after all. And I think there's one really good setup that shows this. Long chain of magnets. When we start our electromagnetic wave, the first magnet pulls the second, which pulls the third, etc. It's just like the restoring forces we saw in the previous examples. Only of course, the magnets don't actually have to be there for the wave to exist, but it's a great demonstration that these waves are maybe not so strange at all. And of course, the implications of electromagnetic waves like this are huge. It's what enables the radio waves that are feeding this video to your phone, your computer, whatever you're watching this on. Waves are absolutely critical to our daily lives. They're everywhere around us. I mean, even when you think about something dumb like the four classical elements, earth, fire, water, air, they're all described by waves. For earth, the waves through our rope were waves of mass, solid stuff, and we didn't talk about gravitational or seismic, just earthquakes, waves today, but those are wave phenomenon too. Fire is an electromagnetic phenomenon. Water, we talked about ocean waves, and air, we talked about sound. Waves truly are a part of everything we do, so I hope this video has helped to add some perspective to your life, and if you enjoyed it, make sure to leave a comment, drop a like, subscribe to the channel. I really appreciate it. Alright, get out.